Members of the House Intelligence Committee are going behind closed doors to review their report on President Trump's dealings with Ukraine. The House of Representatives is back from Thanksgiving recess and is quickly moving to the next phase of impeachment. One House committee prepares to give way to another. Members of the Intelligence Committee will send their report over to the House Judiciary Committee. That committee will in turn hold its first impeachment hearing on Wednesday morning. This is the result of a president who believes that he is beyond indictment, beyond impeachment, beyond any form of accountability, and indeed above the law. And that is a very dangerous thing for this country. Meanwhile, President Trump is headed to London for talks with NATO leaders. The do nothing Democrat decided when I'm going to NATO, this was set up a year ago. They're concerned that if they do not impeach this president, they can't beat him in an election. This is exactly what Alexander Hamilton warned us about. Good morning. It's week three of the public hearings in the impeachment inquiry. We're switching to the Judiciary Committee today, but staying in the same room. And I might be on time. Four law professors are expected to testify about the historical and constitutional basis for impeachment hearings without anyone present from the Trump White House. So while we've been walking, there's been a little bit of news breaking. Um, uh, my colleagues have gotten a hold of the uh, planned testimony that some of these constitutional law experts are going to be giving today. Some of them are going to be testifying that what uh, Trump has done is the perfect example of why the framers of the Constitution invented impeachment. This week's witnesses are law professors, experts on the Constitution. The three Democratic witnesses indicate they believe President Trump committed impeachable offenses. The founding generation, like every generation of Americans since, was especially concerned to protect our government and our democratic process from outside interference. The very idea that a president might seek the aid of a foreign government in his re-election campaign would have horrified them. But based on the evidentiary record, that is what President Trump has done. If what we're talking about is not impeachable, then nothing is impeachable. Saying, Russia, if you're listening, you know, a president who cared about the Constitution would say, Russia, if you're listening, butt out of our elections. This is precisely the misconduct that the framers created a Constitution, including impeachment, to protect against. Jonathan Turley, the sole GOP witness in the hearing, says he is not a Trump supporter and did not vote for the president, but insists Democrats haven't proven the case they say they have. Close enough is not good enough. If you're going to accuse a president of bribery, you need to make it stick because you're trying to remove a duly elected president of the United States. What, like you don't do this every day? <laughs> it's so cold in here. This is not like the emotion of the Ivanovich hearing. This is not like the revelations of the Sondland hearing. There is not a, oh my goodness, I didn't know that moment that's coming up, unless you feel that way generally about constitutional law, which I'm sure there are some of us that do, but by and large, it isn't hitting people like in the heart and in the feelings and in the gut and in the surprise. If the President of the United States attempts to abuse his office, that is a complete impeachable offense. The possibility that the president might get caught in the process of attempting to abuse his office and then not be able to pull it off does not undercut in any way the impeachability of the act. It's technical. This is doing the, the fine needlework of actually sewing together the articles of impeachment. And you have to go through it, but it's, it's not exactly um, ideal TV programming the way that some of the, the uh, past impeachment hearings were. Although, I'm not a TV producer, so maybe I'm totally wrong about that. President Trump did not merely seek to benefit from foreign interference in our elections. He directly and explicitly invited foreign interference in our elections. He used the powers of his office to try to make it happen. He sent his agents to make clear that this is what he wanted and demanded. He was willing to compromise our security and his office personal political gain. No offense to our professors, but please, really, we're bringing you in here today to testify on stuff that most of you have already written about, 
all four, with the opinions that we already know, you couldn't have possibly actually digested the Adam Schiff report from yesterday or the Republican response in any real way. Now, we can be theoretical all we want, but the American people is really going to look at this and say, huh? What are we doing? I don't feel like this is necessarily going to shed new light on details that our people are going to consider or necessarily resolve anything. It feels like we've got two camps that people are digging way into, not finding some sort of an epiphany of a middle ground. I think it's also just really interesting at the end that Nadler said, A majority of this country is clearly prepared to impeach and remove President Trump. I haven't seen a poll that lets you hang your hat on that. Having finished their portion of the impeachment inquiry, House Intelligence Committee Democrats are closely watching what happens in the Judiciary Committee. To this day, it is, I think, ambiguous what the political fact effects of impeachment are. Meaning, in those states where the presidential election will be won or lost, impeachment is, a, is a very much an ambiguous thing. Um, and so the notion that this is sort of, you know, some continuation of some sort of witch hunt is just, is just false on the face of it. Because I think Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff were dragged um, to impeachment by the outrageous fact pattern associated with Ukraine. This is about whether or not a president of the United States can abuse his office, uh, engage in bribe bribery, and then cover it up and do so with impunity. The president back from NATO meetings in London, continues to attack the impeachment inquiry as a hoax. It's a hoax. It's a big, fat hoax. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who controls the House voting schedule, signals Democrats will move forward soon. The facts are uncontested. The president leaves us no choice but to act. Today, with the Speaker announcement, she has weakened this nation. It was not new news. They always had this pre-written timeline from the day they got sworn in. Here was the president overseas making America stronger. And what were the Democrats doing? Dividing us further. As Pelosi leaves her news conference, one particular question from a reporter stops her in her tracks. Do you hate the president, Madam Speaker? Because I, don't, I don't hate anybody. I don't have the greatest in the Catholic House. I don't hate anybody. I think the president is a coward when it comes to helping uh, our, our kids who are afraid of gun violence. I think he is cruel when he doesn't deal with the, the helping our dreamers, the, of which we're very proud. I think he's in denial about the, about the uh, climate crisis. However, that's about the election. This is about the election. Take it up in the election. This is about the Constitution of the United States and the facts that lead to the president's violation of his oath of office. And as a Catholic, I resent your using the word hate in a sentence that addresses me. I don't hate anyone. I was raised in a way that is full, a heart full of love and always prayed for the president. And I still pray for the president. I pray for the president all the time. So don't mess with me when it comes to words like that.